Good evening. Thank you for joining the Dole Institute of Politics for the program this evening. The program this evening is co-sponsored by the Department of Political Science at KU. My name is Irene Carcioni, and I am a member of the Dole Institute's Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The SAB is a bipartisan group. As a member of the SAB, I get access to many great opportunities by being involved with the Institute. If you are a KU student and are interested in joining, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. For this evening's event, if you would like to know more about our guests, the event itself, upcoming Institute events, and more, you can download a printable program handout. The link is in the YouTube event description. This evening's event features a virtual book sale of our guest's book, Out of the Running, Why Millennials Reject Political Careers and Why It Matters. You can find more information on how to purchase this book in the YouTube event description. At the end of this evening's event, we will have time for you to ask questions of our guests. Please type your questions in the YouTube chat box on your screen. Please hold all questions until the end of the program. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please raise your questions with this in mind. Questions that are distracting, disrespectful, or attempt to dominate the chat will be deleted and the user will be removed. This evening's program is closed captioned for the hearing impaired. And now, please join me in welcoming Director of the Institute, Bill Lacey. Thank you very much uh, and welcome everyone. We appreciate your coming to our second program of the week, busy week, pre-election week. Uh, tonight, we've got a really great guest that we had hoped to host back in March, and we were just joking about that a little bit. We, we didn't have to change the program because of the pandemic. We had to change it because of the, basket, the KU basketball schedule. And so we're delighted to have Dr. Shauna Chamez from Rutgers Camden University. Uh, Shauna, welcome to the Digital Dole Institute. It's wonderful to uh, be there with you. Great. Let's start with a little bit of personal information so um, our attendees, our, our viewers know exactly who you are and everything. Can you talk about your upbringing and education and how you decided to get into uh, teaching? Sure. Uh, that could be a very long story. I'll <laughs> I won't go into too many details, but Let's see, my upbringing. I grew up uh, the child of kind of aging hippies in California. I was born and raised near San Francisco. Uh, it gave me kind of a, a love for activism and for politics from a young age. Um, I was always interested in politics in uh, school, in kind of local politics. And this continued, I went uh, from near San Francisco, I grew up in Marin County, and then I went from there to Harvard for undergraduate, uh, where I was kind of active in a variety of political outlets. Um, we had an Institute of Politics uh, that was similar to the Dole Institute there. Uh, we had, let's see, what was so exciting? I was on the undergraduate student council, um, I studied government uh, and social theory and uh, the more kind of political science like classes I took, the more hooked I got. So I didn't actually think of myself uh, as heading down a teaching career at that point. I was thinking of um, a political career. And I went to uh, New York after college where I worked in a small nonprofit for a while. From there, I was just uh, drawn to DC and I wanted to be where I felt all the exciting things were happening uh, politically. I spent about, let's see, two years in New York doing nonprofit and three in uh, DC. Um, and I had this kind of um, revelation. Uh, while I was doing my nonprofit job, my favorite part of the work, it turned out, was going to speak to college classes and conferences. And I just loved college students. I called up a, a roommate of mine from college and I said, Katie, this is gonna sound weird, but 
I'm not happy. And I think I want to teach. And she went, well, duh, Shauna, we've all known that for years. So I was like, well, why didn't you tell me? It took me a while to get there, but I just loved going out, uh, you know, talking about the nonprofit work I was doing with undergraduates, uh, giving guest lectures. Uh, I just had so much fun. It, I didn't learn until I got to graduate school that like there's a bunch more that you have to do to be a professor, it turns out. That was um, an unwelcome surprise. <laughs> but it took a little while. But uh, in my time getting the PhD, I um, started at Georgetown and I decided I did love political science. Um, but I, I missed the kind of depth of knowledge and the, the professors that I'd had at Harvard. I switched back. I finished my PhD there uh, 2014. It took me about eight years to get the PhD, um, mostly because I didn't love doing research at the beginning. I was really in it to teach, uh, which is an unusual reason to get a PhD, it turns out. <laughs> I had to learn to love research um, kind of from the ground up. And now I do. And now I teach research methods and um, I'm really kind of engaged with the, um, the process and the creativity and the, the work that is research. It's just very different from the teaching part. And I never thought that this is what I would be doing. Um, but I came to it kind of slowly uh, after trying lots of things and you know, anybody out there who's kind of confused and doesn't know exactly where you're headed, great. I think that's good. I think it's good to explore and try many paths uh, before you settle on anything. So that's the long answer. Okay, no, that was great. Uh, tell us, why did you write this book? So this was a book based on my dissertation research. And I didn't start out being this book, right? I, I wanted to write... Um, you know, I started my dissertation research with all kinds of big, broad questions. And I had hoped actually to write a different book, which was about how engaged uh, young people were in politics. And it's just not what I found. Now, I, I wanna preface this whole discussion just by saying the times have changed a lot. I published this book in um, 2017, but it was based on research that I did that was 2012 to 2014. And at that time, what I found was a kind of lack of political ambition, as in the desire to hold, run for or hold political office among the young people I was studying. I think, I hope, you know, this is something we can talk more about, Bill, but I think that's changed in the intervening, um, you know, almost decades since I started this research, uh, at least in terms of voter turnout, right before this um, event started, I was looking up numbers and it looks like young people are voting or, or planning to vote at record rates this year. I'm hoping that's a harbinger of, of more civic involvement. I hope it's not a kind of anomaly. Uh, and I hope, you know, that the lackluster participation I was studying um, is on the wane, right? So the book that I ended up writing was not um, what I hoped to find, weirdly. Uh, that's research though, it turns out. You don't get to, you don't get to choose uh, what you find. You get to choose what question you ask. And the question that I wanted to know um, was, well, I started off with this very broad question, which is why do people run for office? Uh, but as I refined the question and anybody doing a re original research, I'm sure if you're doing a senior thesis or anything right now, you have learned, it's, it's very hard to answer a big question well, so you want to narrow it down. And uh, once you get it really narrow and specific, you can really then have a lot to say. So I ended up narrowing the question more and more specifically. So then I became very interested in groups that didn't want to run for office and why. So that was uh, in particular, uh, I was looking at political ambition by gender. So women seem to want to run for office less than men, uh, people of color less than white people. And that got me interested in young people who are underrepresented. 
So I started looking at all of these groups that are um, less represented than their share of the population as candidates and trying to figure out why we didn't see more of those types of people uh, throwing their hats in the ring. What are the main reasons that millennials are reluctant to run for office, at least when your research started? So some of this has changed and some of it has not, I think. So um, what I found is the uh, kind of the way that we have set up being a candidate here in the U.S. is different and in a lot of ways harder than other democracies do it. We have a, a system where you kind of have to identify uh, first, you have to kind of have this individualized ambition where you say, I want to run for office, I want to be a candidate, and then make yourself known to people who could help you. Uh, we have kind of a declining set of political institutions that would do the, the job of recruiting or asking people to run. And foremost among that would be kind of a declining power of political parties. Uh, so uh, even in the last, you can see in the last couple of presidential elections, the people that have won the party's nomination uh, is not who the majority of the party seemed to prefer at the beginning, right? So the role of the party as chooser of the candidate has been declining uh, for you know, half a century at least. Because of that, you have to have kind of a strong individual drive. You have to say to yourself, I'm the best person for the job. Uh, and that takes a fair amount of uh, <laughs> what my people might call chutzpah. You have to be willing to put yourself out there. You have to have the confidence that you are the best person for the job. Um, you have to be uh, kind of knowledgeable enough about the process to begin on your own, even if you then get some help. Um, but all of this favors certain people, right? It favors people who are better educated. It usually favors people who are uh, more wealthy. It favors men over women. Uh, it favors older people who might have the confidence or the connections or know how politics works more than young people. And uh, the way that we fund campaigns here in this country is also highly unusual across democracies. We expect candidates generally to raise all or most of the money that they would need um, for their campaign. We also now have this growing set of outside groups that don't coordinate with the campaign and then do all kinds of things to help or hurt candidates, which is an additional, in a lot of people's mind, barrier um, to wanting to run. Um, but in particular, campaign funding is a, it's just unusual that um, we individualize it to the candidates and kind of make them responsible for that. Usually it's the parties that would uh, choose you to run and then provide you with the funding. In a lot of countries, the state pays the cost of campaigning and there's very strict uh, spending limits. We start campaigns earlier in this country. They last longer. There's no like uh, floor or ceiling generally of um, you know, funds that you can have or money that you should stop spending. It becomes an arms race and that's a huge amount of pressure on candidates. It, it makes for an intimidating kind of situation, especially if you've never done it before, uh, which again would disproportionately impact groups already kind of marginal to politics. Anyway, that's just a few of the reasons that people might be intimidated about thinking about getting started as a candidate um, and young people in particular. In addition to the actual work though, right? There's the work that you have to do of raising all the money, the work that you have to do of setting up an entirely new campaign operation each time that you run. Uh, it's kind of essentially starting a, a small business again and again. There's the um, kind of riskiness of it and the, the risky finances. Uh, all right, so all of this might be work or risk or other things that could be intimidating. In addition to all of that though, Bill, one of the most interesting things that I found is a kind of um, uh, uh, what moral aversion? <laughs> Right. 
a sense among the young people that I was talking to and surveying um, that this is wrong, the way that we fund campaigns and that even though it's not corrupt in the, the sense of against the laws and um, uh, for personal gain, right? We've set it up to be a legal system of campaign financing, but so many of the young people I talked to felt like it was um, kind of morally corrupt or that you'd have to make compromises or that it felt just, you know, in the words of one of them, icky, right? It feels icky to have to ask other people for money just at all, ever. I told one of my interviewees said she can't even bring herself to accept 40 bucks when, you know, she's going back to college and her dad tries to put it in her jeans pocket. She tries to give it back, right? She doesn't want to accept other people's money. So then having to ask for thousands, eventually millions of dollars feels kind of icky. It feels uncomfortable. It also feels like even if you could ask for it, um, there was a sense that accepting the money would make you uh, indebted, right? And that particularly if you accepted corporate money or if you accepted special interest money or if you accepted money from individual donors with particular agendas that you would then have to compromise whatever your own policy positions or principles were uh, to kind of um, uh, be able to make it financially, right? And that's a, that's a deeply uncomfortable feeling. And I think young people often are idealistic and this is uh, in stark contrast to those ideals. This is a highly practical um, proposition. Money is often called the mother's milk of politics that you have to know this, you have to be able to play this game. And so many of the really bright and ambitious young people I was studying just kind of said, Ugh, I don't, that's not how I want to spend my time. One of the things that, uh, that you write, Professor, and out of the running is that millennials feel the political system is broken. A lot of us might agree with them, but why do they feel that way? So there's a couple of um, key breakages that, uh, that they were pointing to. I should note also, it, this is, um, I'm talking about the interviews because the words of the people that I talk to stick in my mind. So that's why I keep mentioning the interviews, but everything that I found out in the interviews, I back up with survey data. Um, I did a survey of elite young people um, <laughs> from a, a couple of different institutions that were pursuing a, a career related to um, law or policy. So they were in law schools or a policy school. And I thought this was a good group of people who might be interested in politics. Uh, so I have some quantitative data in the book as well as the qualitative evidence. Uh, so the, the question is about um, breakages in the system. So one of the survey questions I asked that was really revealing, I thought, was, um, do you believe that politics uh, can solve our most important problems? Right. That's a fairly broad question, but it gave me a baseline of what I like to call kind of system belief. Did these young people I was surveying and interviewing feel like politics was worthwhile? Could it actually solve important problems? Right. I'm a political scientist because I deeply believe in government and its power and ability to help people and to improve lives in a way that uh, other systems can't. Right. I think government is an important and politics, therefore, is a deeply important part of um, human welfare, creating peace, security, a good economy. Right. I already have bought into this idea that politics matters. So I would be at the high end of belief, um, right? I, I think it's uh, vital that the government be involved in solving important problems, but it was a fairly low number, right? About 35% overall of my sample believed that, right? That's, that's a, a little over a third. That's not a good encouraging number if you want a lot of those young people then to, to run for office, to be spending that time and doing all that work and maybe putting aside their um, 
discomfort with the process, they have to really believe that it works. So why did they believe that it didn't work? Uh, they see politics as broken um, right now in a highly partisan way, right? The, that the national level politics and from there trickling down at the state level too, although less so I think, but that politics, the, the, the most visible politics that they see are so deeply partisan and so acrimonious, um, sometimes personally so. So it's not just um, that people disagree, but that people seem to actively dislike and hate each other, um, that people can't agree even enough to kind of have a conversation, right? That, that you can't... Um, you, you can't find a common language even to discuss big problems, right? Um, that we can't agree on what's true or what truth would be enough to um, decide what the most important problems are. Uh, it feels like that kind of disagreement, that kind of acrimony leads to a gridlock that really inhibits young people's um, participation. Uh, at least as candidates, right? They, that they feel like they might be spending all their time and doing all that work to get themselves uh, into a position where they're just beating their head against a wall uh, and can't get anything done. Uh, and they're not wrong. I mean, <laughs> as you say, some of us might agree. If we look just objectively at the numbers, right? The, the last couple Congresses have been some of the least productive in history. We're seeing fewer and fewer laws agreed to largely because there's a shrinking middle so that with more and more um, partisanship, right? The, both parties are being pulled to their respective polls such that we have fewer people in the middle, fewer moderates uh, that can help broker what used to be more um, bipartisan agreements that could then kind of bring the members, the more extreme members of their party along. Uh, that's happening less and less now. It's not just the fault of, uh, you know, individuals who are elected being, um, you know, the standoffish or <laughs> it's, it's not personality based, I would say it's institutional. We have seen a um, vast increase in activism around the primaries, uh, such that, especially starting in 2010, we saw the word primary on the Republican side, especially being used as a verb rather than a noun, right? That will primary out the moderates, uh, which has then happened on the Democratic side as well. But there's an active attempt then to get rid of the moderates that would have allowed for more of that um, bipartisan cooperation at the center. Uh, you can see there's kind of increasing, if you look at the um, ideological scores in terms of how people vote in Congress, you can see on both sides, there's uh, increasing ideological voting. Uh, and I think that has changed the feel of politics, that changes the norms, that changes people's willingness to kind of work together across party lines in a way that is really uh, disastrous, not just for the country, but for young people thinking about going into this as a career. Does the relatively small percentage of young people, women, people of color who now serve in office, does that discourage individuals from those groups from seeking office? It's a hot debate in the literature. Uh, and my take is it does indeed. Um, the question, right, we know these groups are underrepresented and we don't entirely know why, right? But if you look at uh, women uh, have been running for office more in the last couple cycles, and that seems to feed political ambition among young women. Right, we have some good research that says that there's a role model effect. Um, it seems it's harder to study in terms of race because uh, the people of color um, may or may not be kind of uh, inspired by somebody who is of color but not their own race or ethnicity, right? That may not be enough of a trigger. Um, but from what we can tell, and certainly anecdotally, there's a 
kind of a, I think, strong evidence of a role model effect such that when you have a Congress that does not look like the population it represents, you can get a negative feedback loop where people who um, might want to run for office look at the most visible offices and think, oh, well, that's not for me. People like me don't go there. Or if you have more diversity of representation, you have um, uh, you can perhaps get a, a positive role model effect. Um, it, right. I mean, there's there's debate. There's studies that say both things right now. Um, that seems not to be the only factor inhibiting political ambition. Um, but I certainly think it plays a role. It can have the uh, opposite effect, though. So if there's a prominent woman running for office uh, who either loses or who gets um, kind of really slammed by the press or um, treated badly by her opponent, right? It can have an effect of showing people watching this race, oh boy, I don't wanna do that, right? That doesn't look like fun at all to be in her position. I remembered one time I interviewed um, the former attorney general of Iowa, uh, Bonnie Campbell was running for governor, I think in 94. Anyway, I interviewed her a couple years later um, and she was talking about kind of the extreme gendered uh, sexist kind of response to her. And she was afraid that, uh, that other women seeing that might be inhibited rather than inspired in political ambition. Um, part of the problem is if you only have like a, a single person, a token person, and she's the only woman who's ever run for governor, uh, that can make the stakes artificially high for her, uh, which I think they were for that race. It, it became kind of all about her gender. That, that's not good for anybody. Um, so if you can have uh, more of a cohort, if you can have several or multiple uh, women running, then you can see that not women are just not all alike and uh, uh, whatever kind of um, sexist tropes might be used again, against them don't, don't easily apply, right? That, that gives the lie to the, the backlash. What, uh, how do young people kind of gauge the costs and benefits of running for office? So it, it was hard for me to know for a lot of the people I was studying if this was a conscious process or more of an unconscious um, balancing, right? It might be that they were um, kind of, thinking about it already. And when I asked uh, the question, have you ever been told you should run for political office? Right, I asked this on my survey. Almost half of the young people who were in positions where they might then, you know, be good candidates to run for office, almost half of them said they had been told they should run. So it might have been on their minds already, um, but some of them had dismissed it easily. Uh, and I was trying to figure out why. Uh, some of them just thought, oh, well, that's not for me. And then I had to delve more into the unconscious reasons. And some of them had really thought of kind of articulately and carefully about the costs and benefits and could tell me exactly. So it, it, in some ways it was like detective work trying to figure out that question. How do you judge the costs and benefits? So what I tried to do is figure out what did they see as costs and benefits. I figure each person has a set of perceptions already in their head about is politics worthwhile? Is it useful? Can it solve the problems that I want to solve? Can it help people? Uh, there might be some personal benefits you could get, right? People like to be known, usually. They like to um, be recognized. Uh, a lot of people want to be famous, right? That, that there might be these kind of more ego-driven reasons. So that could be a benefit, that could be a reward. Um, 
you know, I, I kind of asked people what they would find rewarding about politics. Some people like the idea of helping others, of serving constituents. Some people like the idea of working with other people to kind of in a democratic way to create the government that, that helps us all. Um, some people just like the strategy of it. Running a campaign could be kind of like a game and they were interested in uh, the strategic element. Uh, anyway, so all of these could be the rewards of politics. But then against that, um, oh, and then if you care deeply, I should mention one more reward, if you care deeply about certain policies, right? So uh, if you're motivated by um, the environment or if you're motivated by the right to bear arms, if you're motivated by reproductive rights either side, uh, you might kind of want to be able to do something on the issues um, in a broad and lasting way and feel like government is the way to do that. So you could be policy motivated, you could be ego motivated, you could be um, kind of helping people or public service motivated. All of these would be the rewards of politics. Um, on the cost side though, I've talked already about the kind of enormous costs in terms of raising money or uh, the feeling of frustration, um, not believing that you could get something done. There might be costs to your perception that politics is currently um, uncivil or um, kind of maybe not a fun place to work, hostile. I, I think I had uh, people tell me, right, that it feels like a hostile environment, um, that you might have to make compromises. That could be a negative. Uh, that the trust in government right now is fairly low, right? It, sorry, not even fairly. I should say it's at the lowest levels that we have measured in the 80 plus years that um, Pew has been studying this, right? The trust in government is extremely low. So that might make you unpopular if you are part of the government, right? That could be a reputational cost. Uh, and there might be personal costs as well. Uh, some of the interviewees, and um, then I added this question to the survey because it was so interesting to me. But some of the people talked about um, the feeling that the, their privacy would be invaded or that their family's privacy might be invaded, that people might go after their kids, might go after their spouse or their family. Um, their parents, right? That was a uh, kind of a horrifying thought and maybe enough to keep people from thinking, oh yeah, I'd like to be in the public eye. I'd like to help people in this way. Um, but boy, not at the expense of uh, my family's privacy. So all of those, I did a balancing kind of um, simulation uh, on an individual basis for the, the people that I was surveying. And I added up just kind of awarded points <laughs> and added up what I thought their cost and reward uh, kind of uh, cost versus reward analysis might be so that I could get, I, I did this numerically and I could get kind of a number. What I found generally was that for most people, they saw rewards, but also high costs. Right, and for a lot of people, the costs seemed higher than the rewards would be good, right? So I call that a candidate deterrence effect that good people were being deterred from running for office because uh, the rewards did not outbalance the costs. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you've mentioned and, and we've seen signs on our campus of greater engagement over the last couple of election cycles among young people, but Historically, their participation is very, very low in elections. And um, I know the Harvard studies, you know, show that very, very clearly. Uh, but what impact does that low participation have on the political system? Uh, the system will govern you whether you participate in it or not. <laughs> so the impact that it has is... Um, just that young people who do not vote don't get to 
kind of have a say in the decisions that the system makes. The system goes on. I, I consider it somewhat less legitimate if, it, if there's a lower participation rate. I'd like to see more participation as a measure of the legitimacy of our, our democratic system. Um, but generally young people haven't seen it as being worth their while uh, to vote at least as much as their elders have. And what it means is that the policies can then end up being skewed in favor of an older generation who voted higher rates. So if resources are in contest or if policy beliefs differ, if young people wanted A and older people wanted B, but young people don't vote as much, the older generation that votes more uh, will win in a repre representational system that is unbalanced like that. We're seeing this interesting demographical effect right now where uh, young people are starting to um, become more and more of the electorate, more and more of the population, such that I was just reading um, more than half of our population now is millennial or younger, right? That's not half of our electorate though. So uh, I think we're gonna still see policies that benefit older people um, or at least the preferences that older people are expressing, but that could change. We could change the whole face of politics if younger people voted at the rates that they're, they're eligible for. Uh, you could see kind of a brand new Congress even. Um, we talked about how young voters are participating at a greater rate uh, in 18, and it looks like definitely in 20. We see the protests for racial equality all across the country. Um, is basically our students beginning, our young people beginning to get more interested in politics because of these big issues and as a reaction to the current administration? I think so. Uh, I saw the, you mentioned the Harvard poll and I was just looking it up um, earlier today, right? This year, 63% of 18 to 29 year olds said they would definitely vote in the election. That's kind of an unheard of rate. That's the highest the Harvard poll has ever tracked. And if that actually happened, that would be an astounding jump in turnout for young people. It's generally, you know, about 40% or less. Um, so we could see kind of an historic shift right now. Um, Sorry, I forgot. I forgot the. I got excited by this shift. I forgot the last part of the question you asked, Bill. Uh, just asking if if the protests for racial right, equality right. and the reason and reaction to the Trump administration. Yeah. Uh, I believe so. Right. These are places where we've seen high levels of student and young people um, activism. Uh, we saw in the last, um, I don't think it's just the Trump administration though. We saw in the last couple of election cycles that the people, the candidates preferred by young people were not chosen. Uh, so I'm thinking in particular of the democratic election, uh, the nomination contest in 2016, that young people strongly preferred uh, Bernie Sanders to Hillary Clinton. And I think turnout was lower among young people in part because of um, that preference turned a lot of young people off from voting for Hillary. Um, the... Let's see, the racial issue I think is critical. This generation, the newest generation coming up in politics, so people coming to uh, voting for the first time is historic for lots of reasons right now, but this generation is far more diverse than any we've seen in the US before. So it's almost a third um, people of color. Uh, and then if you look at the kind of, um, under 30 group inclusive, it's getting on to 40, 45% people of color. The questions of racial justice are very animating. Um, 
it's, you know, it's not entirely a movement driven by young people, but it certainly draws great fuel from their, uh, their energy and their enthusiasm. Um, the support for Donald Trump among young people in 2016 was pretty low. This was not the candidate, even for young Republicans, this was not the candidate that they would have chosen. So the fact that um, he won in the first place was a turnoff for a lot of young people, I think on both sides of the aisle, but then the intervening years and the um, kind of Trump policies, uh, particularly what I think are um, missteps in terms of an ability to reach young people through uh, issues relating to transgender people in the military, say, uh, questions of climate change or things that are deeply important on the policy mind for this generation. Uh, I think all of this has further alienated young people. So there's now a really active um, cohort. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to understand what's fueling that 63% of eligible young people voting who say that they're definitely going to vote. We've just never seen that. It's kind of exciting. Um, I do think part of it's a reaction to um, various things from 2016, but also part of it to the Trump administration itself. Is there a danger, assuming the vice, vice President Biden is elected next week, which we don't know because a lot of us were wrong in 2016, but if he's elected, one of his greatest challenges is going to be balancing the forces on the left with what he feels what he is a, more of a centrist. Mm -hmm. uh, is that going to ultimately, could that work against millennial uh, involvement in politics? It could, absolutely. This is part of why I'm astounded by this like huge surge in youth um, voting. Uh, Biden is also not <laughs> the chosen candidate of uh, young people on the left. Um, his policies are um, kind of not Bernie Sanders uh, in a lot of ways. I think he has not suffered the same drop in youth support that Hillary did for a couple of reasons. Um, I think they will still turn out to vote, but it is interesting. It's not, um, I was, you know, watching the, the most recent presidential debate and it's, two kind of, you know, white guys in their 70s talking to each other. That's not really young people's um, vision often of what they want to see in politics. It doesn't seem to be hampering participation right now. It might even, I'm hoping it will lead to an increase in young people wanting to run themselves, right? That they think, oh, okay, I could, I could be there. I could do that. We've seen a lot of that happen since 2016, right? 2018 was kind of a, a surge of millennials running for office. That was an exciting moment. Um, the, que the ideological question of will Biden then, if he does win, be able to kind of keep that enthusiasm and pull young people along? The, the problem um, and, you know, working at the, an institute that studies politics. Bill, I know you know this. The problem is that campaigns are often exciting and sexy and, and people get really involved. And then the actual act and work of governing can be slow and tedious and not so exciting, especially for young people. Uh, I'm hoping, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, quite how to say it or, or what I mean by it, but I'm hoping that the last couple of years where I think government has not been working well, right? I'm hoping that in some ways that could be um, an impetus for young people to think, oh, I could do this better or maybe the actual kind of governing, it's beyond who wins and who sits in the role but the way that you govern and the way that you treat other people and the people that you surround yourself with and the kind of daily slog of the decisions you have to make. Um, it's not the sexiness of campaigns, but that's what governing is. That's what um, 
the job is, I find it interesting. I'm hoping I'm not in the small minority there. Um, if Biden can, trying to think back to Obama, Obama seemed to find a way to make this, um, if not interesting, at least kind of often explain what he was doing and why. Um, and uh, young people responded to that, I think. There was a positive turnout for Obama. Um, and most seem to see him as a positive role model. He worked kind of you know, frequently to do things in a bipartisan manner. I think that's important, but I, I'm kind of worried that were it such a deeply polarized place, um, I don't know. It, it's hard to preach the virtues of bipartisanship in this um, political moment uh, where we're so polarized. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure you have a better way of saying it than I do. But the, the, the only thing that I can think to say and to tell my own students is um, that democracies die frequently. And this is one of the ways they can die is that if we let each other become the enemy, right, then we lose the whole system. The system has taken hundreds of years to set up. Uh, I won't even say perfect because I don't think we've perfected it at all. Um, but to improve, to be more inclusive, um, it's a system that for a long time was the kind of the gold standard. Uh, other countries still emulate us, even though I think we've made missteps in how we do democracy, particularly around campaign finance right now. Uh, but to say, as I've had young people say to me, um, oh, the whole system's just screwed up. We should just start over, right? That I think it's, um, it's just like a knife to the heart for a political scientist. Uh, it, setting up democracy and making a democracy work and function is unbelievably difficult and painful and painstaking. Uh, and it's really easy to lose. It's hard to get and easy to lose. So, uh, you know, I'm just deeply hopeful that Biden has the whatever it will take uh, if he's elected. I hope he has the ability to show bipartisanship in a good light. I don't know. That's a big question for me too. Um, I have one final question tonight, but we're gonna open it up to audience Q&A after I ask my next question. So if you have a question, if you're watching tonight, you have a question, please post it in uh, the chat section and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Do abide by our guidelines that you heard at the very beginning of the program. Be civil, be courteous, ask a brief question, uh, no long questions or statements. Uh, but Professor, let me ask my final question tonight. Uh, what are, I know one of the things you do in the book that I, I think is, uh, is a great effort is you talk about ways to reform politics to get more millennials involved. What are some of those ideas? Well, they range from uh, kind of small things we could do to real pie in the sky, things I'd love to see. Um, so I'll start with those latter ones. They're more interesting, but maybe less, um, uh, certainly less immediate, <laughs> maybe even less possible. Um, but I, I just think we're not going to see the the best and the brightest young people who I'd love to see feel like politics matters. I don't think they're going to want to be candidates unless we can show them that the system can work and can um, accommodate whatever their vision is of a working democracy and that it's not just people shouting at each other or it's not just about gridlock. So to, um, what? <laughs> make politics work again, um, to certainly make politics civil, uh, respectful, that we can disagree, but we're all trying to make a democracy work um, is an important part of a solution. Beyond that though, like I said, I tend to think it's not just that individuals are being mean to each other. There are institutional reasons 
that uh, that we're seeing gridlock or partisan animosity. Uh, so I'd like to see, it, it, I, I guess we can't go back and undo Citizens United, which was a, um, to my mind, fairly disastrous Supreme Court decision of 2010 that allowed greater corporate um, power and spending in politics. But I think we could, uh, if necessary, we have to change the constitution. We have to get money out of politics, not entirely, but to the degree that it is distorting and disrupting um, our democracy, uh, it just greatly turns off good young people who might wanna make this a career. Uh, if we could set some reasonable limits on the amount of time and the amount of money one has to spend campaigning, uh, the, the never ending campaign where, uh, you know, it's about 18 months generally, if you want to <laughs> win a seat, that's in stark contrast to like uh, in European countries, in the UK, you have like a six week election period, right? I know a lot, of, a lot of the young people I talk to would be happy to run for office if it, they didn't feel like it would drain their entire lifeblood. I think uh, if we can't do this legally, we need to at least do it kind of through some stronger norms to set um, limits on attacking politicians' families uh, or on exposing them. Th this is getting harder and harder in a kind of gotcha social media environment. But this is, a, this is a disaster for democracy that good people are turned off because they're going to get um, just unbelievably harassed by uh, the people that they're seeking to represent. Um, I, I wish we could kind of come together as citizens at least, and if not make laws about that to, to say morally that we won't um, stand for it. That's not how we want politics to be done. If somebody uh, is going to kind of give up their life to represent us, they should at least be treated with respect. Certainly their families should be. Um, the kind of system, the primary system is a, um, it's a puzzle right now. It, it, we did not always select nominees by primary, and I'm not sure it's a very good way to do it. The, the, the electorate who votes in primaries is not like the general election uh, voters, right? People who vote in primaries are a far smaller, um, far more ideologically polarized, um, uh, kind of usually more activist group, um, people who donate to primary candidates. And this is kind of increasingly skewing politics so that the people who are actually becoming the candidates are the most ideologically distinct so that Republicans become more and more conservative and Democrats more and more liberal. But this then makes the governing and the agreeing with each other and the working together to have a, a good democracy much harder. Uh, I don't think primaries are the best mechanism. I don't think we've tried nearly enough um, other ways of uh, choosing candidates. And part of that is distorted already by the, the, the money problem that it's not um, parties who have control of who can be the standard bearer for their name. Um, generally in political science, we think this is a problem for democracy. We'd like to see what we call the responsible parties. So you have a political party works very hard to have a platform to choose its candidates and to present kind of a united front to voters, uh, this would be far preferable than having kind of uh, anybody be able to steal the, the political party mantle as long as they have enough money or media clout um, to have people say that they're ex party when they haven't been before. It's a, it's a very weird system that we have. It doesn't fit the responsible party model that uh, generally I think has worked um, much better in a representational democracy. Part of the problem for that, that I, sorry, Bill, I could go on forever here. That's, 
<laughs> how to change the system. All right, just a few last things. If you have single member districts, right? Districts, smaller districts where only one person can win, political scientists have found those are where you get two kind of large and not very distinct political parties, right? If you could have a um, system of voting where you could encourage multiple parties instead of single member districts with what we call first past the post or a winner take all system. Anyway, the institutional setup has been leading us toward uh, kind of parties that don't have as clear um, and responsible party platforms and um, it's getting very wonkish, I'm sorry. The, the point is that we could change some institutional structures. We could certainly change campaign financing. Um, we could uh, kind of have more groups and individuals and I would hope party power to do the selection of the nominees and people could then be kind of encouraged to run and taught more how to do it um, rather than having to have this individual ambition drive that is often uh, detrimental to those who are already underrepresented. Oh, I'll stop there. <laughs> okay. Um, don't worry at all, Professor, about being wonkish. Everybody yeah, knows right. politi okay. <laughs> political junkies are total nerds. I mean, it's true. you know, nerds we, are cool now, that. I hear. <laughs> yeah. yeah, everybody watching tonight is by definition a political junkie. Okay, good. So, no, no, nobody was bothered by that at all. Excellent. I do have uh, our first question, though. Um, and this is an interesting question. So, I'm eager to hear how you respond. Right. Mark J asked, do you really believe there's a lack of young people who want to get into politics? In my experience, there have always been plenty of young people who want to go to D.C. and get involved. I think, I hope that's true, Mark. Uh, it's fewer uh, lately, uh, measurably fewer um, young people. Right, so we can tell from national opinion polls like the Harvard poll that fewer people have been saying they want careers in politics, at least under this administration. Um, it's hard to say why that is or if it has something to do with um, just the kind of um, sense of uh, uh, right, there's a sense of from our president now that politics is all corrupt or DC is a swamp and uh, right, uh, that government is, a, is the problem. That's not a hugely inspirational message that might draw more young people into politics. Um, we have seen surges. I'm thinking back to uh, when I teach the presidency, we look at FDR and he brought kind of this surge of young people to fill up the various uh, government departments that he started creating with the New Deal. That um, was kind of a measurable um, increase in, if not political ambition, the young people wanting to be candidates, certainly kind of um, political careers uh, that young people started having. Uh, we have seen less of that. It's not that it's zero though, by all means. And I think there's always good young people um, wanting to do politics. The question for me is, do they want to be candidates? I think we've seen more of that actually, ironically, and not in a good way for my book sales. Uh, since I published the book, that started rising. Uh, we saw it rise starting right after 2016 for all these reasons I've mentioned, I think. So I am encouraged by that. Um, I'm just hoping it's not uh, a blip, right? It, it could be that the all the excitement and all the events happening since 2016 have encouraged young people to be political candidates or um, hopefully to, to get involved in political careers, even if they're not candidates. Uh, to see government as public service. But I'm afraid, you know, having done all this research for a couple of years, 
that all of the things I found are still waiting there below the surface, that the um, disillusionment with politics or the feeling that it doesn't work uh, could still turn off a lot of young people. Um, and it might not be immediate. It might be that a lot of young people get involved right now, and I hope so, but that seeing these underlying problems that we haven't been able to fix for a couple decades, they will leave right? It's entirely possible that <laughs> my next book will have to be about the, the leaking pipeline of young people out of DC. Um, we'll see. I hope you're right and I'm not, but I, I do think that I found something important in this research that suggests the system is turning away good people. Okay. David D. asked, have your students identified a policy or political role model perhaps AOC and members of the squad, Bernie Sanders? Sure, yeah. Uh, I think AOC has excited a lot of my students, um, particularly those who felt like Congress wasn't somewhere they could ever be or might ever want to work. To see somebody so young and uh, racially di different and diverse, uh, different from what they are used to in terms of, oh, that's what Congress looks like. Um, somebody also who's, you know, extremely savvy about social media and um, engaged in the ways that they are often engaged in politics and they're on Twitter um, and kind of able to uh, speak in a language that they recognize. I think all of that's been really exciting. In addition to the policy positions, um, I have students, a lot of my students have brought up the Green New Deal as being something encouraging. Um, I also have conservative students though, who have, uh, AOC is certainly not their preferred candidate, but they have strong policy beliefs, right? In New Jersey, I have a lot of students who are uh, very pro-gun rights and, and this is a motivation for them to, to get into politics. Um, students who want to see uh, business or small businesses in particular because they come from that background or that's what they saw from their parents uh, and they uh, are either kind of anti-taxes or kind of pro-supplements for small businesses, right? From whatever position, I think there is absolutely policies and people that can draw young people in. But there's also um, either uh, moments or experiences that kind of push them out. Uh, that's that balancing. And um, I have a lot of students who just feel like politics is only for the wealthy uh, or you know, why vote the parties are like, it won't make any difference. The parties have different areas sewn up. Oh, New Jersey's always going to go blue. They say, no matter what I do, so that my conservative students often feel disenfranchised in that way. Uh, and so part of that goes back to the winner take all um, district problem that they don't feel represented. Uh, part of it's the electoral college, which I wish we would do something about, but that's another topic entirely. Um, so, you know, it's not all bad news. I don't mean to get up here and suggest uh, young people are completely anti-politics. No, but not at all. I mean, I, I think, you know, I can't see all of you, but I figure you who would give up your night to, to hear about this are extremely, you know, like uh, Bill says, political nerds like me, um, extremely kind of interested in politics. You probably believe like me that um, government and politics is important. And I have lots of students who believe that also. My fear is just that there's these negative aspects that uh, take away from the belief that it can matter or uh, that it's a useful career choice, right? That bums me out that there's these um, negatives uh, and that sometimes the negatives are stronger than the positives. If the negatives get worse in the future, and they could, right? Campaign financing could get worse and not better. Um, I'm afraid that that's uh, just a real detriment for democracy as a whole to lose the participation, maybe not through voting, right? We're, we're seeing surges of voting, but through um, 
kind of the, the candidacies of young people. I'd just love to see more young people running for office, especially late, you know, uh, lately at the lower level so that you could get that kind of experience to then move up. Mm -hmm. Stephen L. asks, is it possible that younger voters might be interested in the initiative and referenda process, particularly those in states that lack the initiative process? That might that that they might be galvanized to bring it to those states. Sure, uh, that's an interesting concept. I don't know, Stephen, of any research on young people in the initiative process in particular, but it's a great question. Uh, the initiative process is a, I think, is appealing to young people. Um, particularly those who feel like established politics or the legislative uh, kind of pathway for policy is blocked uh, or is ineffective. And uh, if you believe my research, a lot of young people feel that way now. So the initiative process would be a natural kind of alternative that would make a lot of sense. Um, I'm from California originally, I do have to warn you, the initiative process has a fair amount of flaws. Also, it's not a panacea. I don't, um, I don't think that it's kind of uh, all good, but it's interesting. It can get around roadblocks sometimes. Um, I think it has galvanized young people, particularly in watching the kind of relatively fast, um, uh, movement in some states, at least, of medical and now recreational marijuana legalization, right? That's, I think, exciting for a lot of young people who have felt like this was stymied in legislatures uh, for a very long time and should be passed. Um, we've seen in a bunch of states now uh, legalization. It's on the ballot in New Jersey. I just uh, saw it on my ballot when I voted early uh, last week. So that's interesting. Um, I, I think it's a senior thesis, Stephen, that you need to do. <laughs> That's a great suggestion. Uh, maybe Stephen will take us take you up on that. Uh, I have time for one last question, Professor. Um, this one is, is the increased ideological partisanship eliminating moderates too far broken to repair? Oh, God. <laughs> Had to end on a tough one, huh? Is it too far broken to repair? Um, I'm feeling hopeful tonight. Uh, I'm, you know, here virtually with Bill and he's got a nice fire and it's a nice atmosphere of kind of convivial um, <laughs> political bipartisan harmony. I'm feeling um, good about democracy. So I'll say, no, it's not too broken to repair. Um, I'm thinking particularly of deep, deep partisan divisions that we've seen in this country before right? This country has made it through some amazingly tough times. And I know that this feels like a deeply divided time right now. But when I talk about the presidency with my students, we start with the election of uh, 1796, which if you think this is a partisan election right now, my God, 1796, if you read about the vicious personal attacks, the um, unbelievable uh, kind of uh, the partisanship that almost tore our country apart when we had only just approved the constitution. Uh, so uh, Jefferson versus Adams, I mean, it, it doesn't get worse than that until then the 1850s, right? We had a period of uh, which we call the bleeding 50s because the country was being so torn apart that eventually we had a civil war, right? It, these are just moments um, that I think of that somehow we were able to recover from. I think democracies always feel unstable. It's a, it's a very hard form of government. It's a very optimistic form of government to believe that we are collectively able to trust each other and our fates to each other enough to share power, that, that's idealistic. It's um, unbelievably kind of um, hopeful. Uh, it has 
not worked in most of the cases where it has been tried. And it almost did not work here in this country at a number of times, right? Right when we first began, we almost tore ourselves apart. Uh, you know, the Civil War, we almost tore ourselves apart again. There was a period um, not too long ago, a couple decades ago, when from what my parents say, it feels like the country was collapsing in the 60s. There were so many kind of um, movements, the political system was really on fire. I'm thinking of the protests at the Democratic Convention in 68. Um, and that was deep, not intra, not inter, but intra-partisan division. Um, and the, the, the riots, right? The kind of feeling that our country couldn't possibly continue. Um, I wasn't there. This is what I hear it felt like to some people. I think we're feeling that now though. Right, that this feels like such a deeply partisan and painful election. Um, I'm very hopeful. Uh, I'm buoyed by this fire and this kind of good feeling of this event. But I'm very hopeful from my knowledge of American history that we have survived worse. Um, that said, I really do though want to urge you who are here and listening and can spread this message on we have faced tough times before and we can get through this, but we may not know immediately who has won the election. And I remember going through this in 2000, we didn't know who the president was going to be. And that was a really painful moment and it took several weeks to resolve. And that was maybe one of those moments when it felt like the country was falling apart. I think given that there's so much voting happening by mail right now, that this might be another one of those moments. And it's a dangerous time for democracy, right? I, I'm afraid that either side will be upset by whatever the outcome is and that people won't be patient and let the democratic process work. And that to me would be more disastrous than either side winning, right? So if you can just urge, know that this may not happen immediately and urge patience for the process, if you can trust the process a little, it has taken us a very long time to get this process. It's not perfect. It's not even, you know, great. Uh, Winston Churchill said democracy is the worst form of government except all those others that have been tried from time to time, all right? Democracy is hard. Um, I think we can get through this. I think we are good enough. I think uh, the American people are smart enough and we can learn to trust each other again, but we have to um, have a little bit of faith in the process. And I think that will be hard this year. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully I'm right. <laughs> and you can share my idealism and if we can all hold virtual hands this year, you know, with a lot of hand sanitizer, I guess. Uh, I, I do think we can overcome it, but we need the system to be able to work. Professor Shamez's book is Out of the Running, Why Millennials Reject Political Careers and Why It Matters. Uh, it's available for purchase, as the uh, student welcome said, at the KU Bookstore. We also have, and you can see this on YouTube, uh, the YouTube page. You can also get a book plate from the Dole Institute that'll be signed by the professor. Uh, so it would be, um, you know, authentic and everything. I did. Anyway, I signed Sean, them all ahead. <laughs> yes. Shauna, I want to thank you very much. It was an outstanding program. We appreciate your time tonight. Thanks for joining us. This has actually made me feel better, Phil, talking with you. So I, I've really enjoyed it. And these are wonderful questions from your students. Uh, thank you all. Yeah. And thank everyone for watching tonight. We really appreciate your support of the Dole Institute. Look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks for the Elizabeth Dole Lecture, which will feature uh, Major General Diana Holland from the United States Army Corps of Engineers. So hope you can join us then. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thank you for joining the Dole Institute of Politics for our program this evening. 
If you are a student and would like to join the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. Join us next week for the November installment of the Fort Leavenworth Military History Series with guest speaker Dr. Jeff Babb, who will discuss the turning point in the China, Burma, India theater in World War II. You can access this program on the Dole Institute's YouTube channel, just like tonight's program. Refer to the doleinstitute.org for up-to-date information on all of our upcoming programs. If you enjoyed tonight's program, consider becoming a friend of the Dole Institute by donating to help make programs like this possible. We hope you enjoyed this evening's program. Thank you and good night.